I'd like to welcome everyone to our Heart Ambassador Lecture Series. Uh, good afternoon and happy Sunday. Uh, my name is Patrick Schilling and I am a clinical exercise physiologist and manager in cardiac rehab here at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. We again miss seeing you, all of you in person as in years past, we are, but we are happy to be able to continue our tradition of providing this free series to you, albeit in a virtual fashion this year. Please note, each of our presentations will be recorded and available for viewing again after today on the BayStateHealth.org website under the heart icon. We hope this is helpful for those of you who would like to share this presentation with others and for those who are unable to attend the event live today. You can also register for our upcoming lectures in the same area on the BayStateHealth.org website. Before we introduce our speakers today, I want to thank Andrew Pond, and Sue Fontaine for their ongoing support with technology and marketing. We know this program would not be possible without your ongoing work, and you are rock stars for us behind the scenes. As in years past, we will welcome your questions and address them at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions in the Q&A area on the right-hand side of your screen. We simply ask you to keep your questions pertinent to our topic today, and we will address as many as possible at the end. Finally, you will have an opportunity to provide comments and feedback about today's presentation immediately following this WebEx presentation. Uh, so without further ado, um, we'd like to offer you an opportunity to participate in a poll question that we have um, prepared for you. So before we get started, we wanna know um, how many people here logging in today know or have heart disease or currently live with someone with heart disease and the answer choices are up in the poll question on your right hand side so if you could take a moment to click yes no or unsure we would appreciate it and we'll give this about 15 seconds uh, for you to provide an answer to this question All right, if we could um, close the poll, Andrew, and then bring up the responses. I'm hoping that we will find something interesting as a result of doing this. All right, so it looks like almost half of the people online, 35 out of 81, know someone with heart disease or currently have it themselves. Um, about one quarter of those um, do not know someone or have it themselves, and about 20, uh, I'm sorry, about 6 out of 81 um, are unsure if they have heart disease or not. So I think if you're tuning in today for those six participants, you will find out um, from Dr. Zigatella today, uh, hopefully some answers to these questions. And uh, I'd like to introduce at this time Dr. Zachary Zigatella is a general cardiologist at Bay State Wing Hospital in Palmer, Massachusetts. Dr. Zigatella obtained his medical, medical degree at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He went on to complete his internship, residency, and fellowship at the UMass Memorial Medical Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. We are thrilled to have our Eastern Region of Bay State Health represented today. And we know Dr. Zigatella, much loved by his patients, whom I'm sure we'll, we have joining us today, will all gain valuable insight. So thank you, and I will hand it over to Dr. Zigatella at this point. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, so I'm a clinical cardiologist working at Bay State Wing Hospital. I've been here about um, eight to nine years, and um, I really look forward to the opportunity to speak to you today about one of the most common symptoms of one of the most life-threatening diseases, chest pain. And I want to send a special thanks to Sue and Heidi for offering me this opportunity. And thank you to Clinton and Andrew to helping us get through all the technical issues, allowing us to do this presentation today. Um, first of all, a little disclaimer, it's a little bit weird sitting alone in my office talking to a computer screen for this amount of time. I mean, I've had up to a year to do this with the implementation of telehealth. I've just uh, never had a one-person dialogue for so long. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, and I look forward to answering any questions towards the end. Okay, so during this talk, 
I'm going to give a brief overview about the epidemiology of coronary artery disease. And I'm going to talk about the different causes of chest pain. Not all chest pain is related to the heart. I'm going to go over a brief overview about basic cardiac anatomy and physiology. And most importantly, I'm going to describe for you angina, which is the medical term for discomfort in the chest as a result of inadequate blood flow through the coronary arteries. I'm going to go over what to expect if you go to the ER with chest pain and how heart disease is diagnosed and treated. And lastly, I'm going to go over some pharmacologic therapy and finish with a focus on disease prevention. So as I just found out, many of you are tuning in because you have either personally been affected by heart disease or know a close friend or a family member who has. And the statistics are pretty sobering. It's the leading cause of death in the United States, responsible for over 600,000 deaths each year. And it's estimated that one person has a heart attack every 40 seconds. And about 7.6 million annual chest pain visits occur in the emergency department in the U.S. every year. And this leads to a staggering health care cost of $219 billion per year. And heart disease doesn't discriminate across different races or ethnic groups. Um, whether you're Black or white, Hispanic or Asian, it's responsible for somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of all deaths. And that's pretty similar in men or women across different ethnic groups. So historically, cardiovascular disease has been ranked as the number one cause of death, both globally and in the United States, ranking above cancer and chronic respiratory diseases and stroke. And according to a CDC survey since 2000, chest pain has consistently ranked as the leading cause of ambulance visits to the emergency department responsible for about 20 to 25 percent of all visits um, coming ahead of abdominal pain as the second most common reason for an ER visit through the ambulance. So what is the likelihood that if someone comes into the ER with chest pain that it's actually an acute heart attack? Well, I found this retrospective observational population study of over 60,000 patients in Denmark and of all the patients coming in, only about 10% actually were diagnosed with heart disease, whereas about 50% were diagnosed with something else, some other non-cardiac cause of chest pain, and about 50 to 60% were discharged without a final diagnosis. But importantly, patients with chest pain who had heart disease had the highest overall mortality. So during the past year, we've all been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. And while heart disease has historically been ranked as the number one cause of death in the United States, during this past year, it's actually been superseded by deaths from COVID-19. And as you can see here in this graph, um, blue, the blue line is over time the deaths of heart disease. And as you can see, over the past year, the numbers of COVID-19 deaths have steadily risen, and somewhere between November and December actually surpassed deaths from heart disease. But what's interesting is, looking at the first wave between March and May, as you can see here, there was a corresponding spike in the number of deaths from heart disease at the same time. So you know, why did this happen? So I found a study looking at emergency department visits in New York during the pandemic. And this kind of sheds some light on what might be going on. So January through April, as the number of COVID-19 cases steadily rose, and that's the blue arrow, the number of visits to the emergency department steadily declined. So why is this? Um, so a little bit more data on this. So when you look at um, comparing corresponding times in 2019 and 2020, um, the blue line being 2019 and the red line in 2020, over the same period of time, you can see here that deaths from cerebrovascular disease and other circulatory diseases are pretty similar. There was an increase in the deaths of 
hypertensive heart disease in 2020 compared to 2019. Deaths from heart failure, surprisingly, were pretty similar. But deaths from ischemic heart disease, seen here in the red in 2020, surpassed deaths from ischemic heart disease back in 2019. And this difference was even more pronounced in New York, as you can see here, where there was a large spike in deaths from ischemic heart disease in 2020 compared to a similar time period back in 2019. So why is this the case? Um, I think it's primarily because patients fear contracting the virus. So they stay home, they avoid going to the ER, and they suffer with, with their pain, with their angina, and then potentially have a heart attack at home because they're more scared about going to the ER, or going to the hospital and contracting the virus. And I also think it could be due to a reduction in bystander CPR and also related to the cancelization and delay of outpatient visits and elective procedures that otherwise would have happened. So there it's, I think it's multifactorial. There's a lot of different reasons for this. Okay, so now I'm going to shift focus to talk about the different causes of chest pain. And while heart disease is one of the most dangerous and life-threatening causes of chest pain, it's not the only cause of chest pain. So you can have chest discomfort related to the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, and the musculoskeletal system. So I find it best to just think of what other organ systems are in the chest cavity or near the chest cavity when thinking about the differential diagnosis. Okay. So there are multiple gastrointestinal causes of chest pain that we see every single day. And this makes sense because the esophagus or the food pipe sits right behind the heart in the center of the chest. So anything which causes inflammation or injury or irritation to the esophagus will cause pain. And that could be experienced by the patient as chest pain and it can very well mimic a heart attack. So different causes of gastrointestinal chest pain include gastroesophageal reflux disease or esophagitis, heartburn, esophageal spasm, even gallstones can present with lower chest pain, mimicking a heart attack, and inflammation of the stomach or gastritis or even peptic ulcer disease can cause chest pain. So what are the clues that someone's chest pain might be coming from the gastrointestinal tract? Well, if the pain is worse after eating a meal, if your pain is relieved with an antacid or with belching, if your pain is worse laying down in bed at night and even wakes you up at night, and if your pain is associated with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, or diarrhea, and if you've had recent use of aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Motrin, any of this would point to a GI source of chest pain. And chances are, if you had one of these burgers um, and you have pain afterwards, it's probably not coming from the heart, despite what these burgers are called. So this is um, an illustration from the Vortex Grill in Atlanta. I actually went there after a conference and fellowship, and I ended up having the double coronary artery bypass surgery. It was delicious, but I, I didn't have an appetite for like three days. But they actually have a triple coronary artery bypass and a quadruple. And with the quadruple, there are eight burger patties, eight slices of toast, 28 slices of cheese, four fried eggs, and 27 strips of bacon, accounting for 9,606 calories. So if you have something like this and you get a little abdominal pain or chest pain, you probably shouldn't be eating much more of that. All right. Um, there are also a variety of pulmonary causes of chest pain related to the lungs. Um, so pneumonia can cause chest pain. Um, an asthma exacerbation or an exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or emphysema. A pneumothorax, which is a rupture in the lining of the lung, um, can cause sudden and severe chest pain, mimicking a heart attack. And a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot um, developing in the veins, usually of the lower legs, which breaks off and spreads to the lungs. So what are the clues for pulmonary causes of chest pain? Well, if your pain is worse with taking a deep breath or worse with coughing, most likely it's coming from the lungs. It also could be coming from the musculoskeletal system as well. If your pain is associated with shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, and a fever, that would suggest possibly asthma, COPD, or pneumonia. If you have signs of a blood clot 
in your leg or a DVT with calf pain or swelling associated with shortness of breath, you want to be thinking about a pulmonary embolism. And if your chest pain is relieved with inhalers, that would suggest that your discomfort is more from asthma or COPD. There are also a couple of neurologic or psychiatric causes of chest pain. So an acute panic attack, a panic attack with the great mimickers. Uh, a panic attack can cause chest pain, which to the patient can feel like they're having a heart attack, but it also can cause palpitations, which make the patient feel like they're having an abnormal heart rhythm. So sometimes it's difficult to distinguish, but if your pain is relieved with deep breathing and relaxation techniques or an anti-anxiety medication, it might just be due to a panic attack, but sometimes it does take further testing to provide that reassurance. And shingles or herpes zoster is another rare cause of chest pain. Herpes zoster is interesting in that the pain often precedes the development of this very characteristic vesicular rash, which occurs usually on one side of the body in a dermatomal distribution. And after the rash subsides, Patients can be left with pain for months afterwards with a condition called post-herpetic neuralgia. And there are musculoskeletal causes of chest pain that should be considered. Um, so costochondritis, um, which is inflammation uh, in a small piece of cartilage that attaches the rib cage to the sternum, can cause chest pain. It's usually very tender and focal. If you have a rib fracture as a result of trauma or a fall, that's very much going to cause severe chest pain. It's going to be worse with changing position and taking a deep breath. And any type of muscle strain can cause chest pain. And what are the clues for musculoskeletal chest pain? Well, I, I think if your pain is sharp, if it's focal, if it's reproducible when you press on it, um, if, it's, if it's worsened with change of position in bed at night, if it's worsened with coughing, um, and if there's a history of recent heavy lifting, falls, or chest wall trauma, that would suggest that it's a musculoskeletal cause. Um, if you have overlying redness, um, bruising, or swelling, and if you experience relief after taking an anti-inflammatory medication. Well, obviously this is a clinical diagnosis of exclusion. You know, you can't, you can't rule this in or really rule it out. You have to exclude other causes, but really a careful history is key here. So now I'm gonna talk about a few important cardiac causes of chest pain, and it's not just related to heart disease. All right, so heart disease can be a major cause, and I'm going to talk a lot about that later. But you can actually have spasm of the coronary arteries, which can cause chest pain, or Prince Metal's angina. And you can have inflammation of a thin lining surrounding the heart, the pericardium, with a condition called pericarditis. And one of the most rare, but potentially life-threatening cause of chest pain is an aortic dissection, uh, a tear in the aorta. And I'll talk briefly about that a little bit later. So pericarditis um, is not uncommon. I, I do see a few cases uh, every year. It affects men and women of all ages. It's an inflammation of this layer of pericardium that surrounds the heart. And it's usually caused by a upper respiratory tract virus preceded by coughing, fevers, or chills. Um, other etiologies include autoimmune disorders like lupus, or bacterial infections. Um, it can occur after a heart attack and occur after open heart surgery. This pain is very characteristic. It's usually worsened with taking a deep breath that may radiate to the mid-back. It's worse than laying flat, and it's alleviated with leaning forward. And it has very characteristic EKG changes as well. And this is what a normal pericardium looks like, an example of what an inflamed pericardium can look like. Okay, so aortic dissection is, is like I said, a rare, and life-threatening cause of chest pain that has the highest overall mortality. Um, it's caused by a tear in the lining of the aorta, which is a major blood vessel that extends from the heart to the rest of the body. It's typically described as a sudden and intense, severe chest discomfort, which may radiate to the back. It's often described as a ripping or tearing sensation, and it doesn't let up. You know, this is not a little twinge. This isn't something that's gonna be positional or affected by deep breathing. You're gonna know it and you're going to need to go to the ER. And if you have a dissection that involves the upper part of the aorta or a type A dissection, this is a surgical emergency, and you have to be taken to the operating room right away. And that just shows what the tear in the upper part of the aorta or a type A aorta dissection will look like. 
All right, so now I'm going to shift focus to talking about the major topic, coronary artery disease. And I'm going to talk about anatomy and physiology, angina, what to expect in the ER, how do we treat a heart attack, and the role of stress testing, pharmacologic therapy, and prevention. Okay, so this is an actual heart muscle. It's kind of like what it looks like. It's, um, it's a big pump. It's a muscle, essentially. It fills with blood and then pumps blood. But to make it easier to understand, this is the traditional depiction of the heart. And I'm just going to show you that the heart is divided into two upper chambers, the atria, and two lower chambers, the ventricle. Okay? Um, so venous blood without oxygen is delivered to the heart from the lower part of the body through the IVC and from the upper part of the body through the SVC from the brain. And this blue blood or deoxygenated blood then fills the right atrium. And when the pressure in the right atrium exceeds the pressure in the right ventricle below it, the tricuspid valve opens and blood empties into the right ventricle. Then the right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs. And the air we breathe delivers oxygen, making the blue blood red. And this blood is recirculated to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. When the pressure in the left atrium then exceeds the pressure in the left ventricle, the mitral valve opens. And that allows blood to empty passively from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And the left ventricle, the major pumping chamber, then pumps the blood to all the vital organs in the rest of the body. But also back to the heart, because the heart's an organ and it needs its own blood supply. So it basically provides its own blood supply by pumping blood down the coronary arteries. Okay. And here's just a couple of movies um, illustrating the cardiac physiology. So um, to the left of your screen, you're going to see an illustration of the electrical conduction system. So in order to pump blood, the heart needs its own electrical stimulation. And the SA node in the right upper chamber of the heart provides the spark plug generating the electrical impulse that then spreads throughout the upper chambers to the AV node where there's a short delay and then to the lower chambers, causing the ventricles to contract and pump blood. And this allows blood, as you see on the right of the screen, to move from the upper chambers to the lower chambers, the right side pumping blood to the lung, the left side pumping oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So what is coronary artery disease? So coronary artery disease is due to a process called atherosclerosis, which is the gradual buildup of cholesterol within the walls of the coronary artery. And when this cholesterol grows to a certain extent and restricts blood flow down the coronary arteries, this can cause chest pain called angina, which is basically due to an imbalance between blood supply and demand. A heart attack occurs when this chronic plaque of cholesterol becomes inflamed and ruptures, and a blood clot forms at the site, turning maybe a minor narrowing into a severe narrowing, and that can cause pain, and that can be an emergency. Okay, so the heart muscle is supplied by three main arteries. So you have the right coronary artery, which provides blood flow to the right side of the heart, the left anterior descending artery, which provides blood flow to the front and left side of the heart, and then you have the circumflex artery, which supplies blood to the lateral aspect and the posterior aspect of the heart. And when you have a plaque buildup, let's say here in the LAD, blood flow down the rest of the artery to that region of the heart muscle is restricted. And this causes the gradual narrowing of the artery over time. And if it narrows enough, then it causes the discomfort called angina. So it usually has to get 60 to 70% narrowed for that to occur with certain situations. So what the heck is angina? Well, so it turns out, Angina was described by William Keberden more than two centuries ago. In a presentation to the Royal College of Physicians, he described angina as a sense of strangling and anxiety. The patient is seized when they are walking. It is a painful and disagreeable sensation as if it would extinguish life. But the moment they stand hill, still the uneasiness vanishes. The pain is situated in the upper part, sometimes the middle, and frequently extends from the breast to the middle of the left arm. So what was true over two centuries true 
uh, two centuries ago holds true today. This is, a, this is a nice description of angina. It's provoked by physical activity, it's alleviated with rest, and it often may radiate to the left arm. It's derived from the Latin terms meaning to strangle and chest, angina pectoris. And this is a response I've heard from patients just too often throughout the years. But doctor, it's not a pain, it's just a pressure. So I want to make it very clear, and this is one of the most important slides, that pain doesn't have to be sharp and stabbing. In fact, angina is more commonly described as a dull and sometimes mild pressure, not a stabbing, squeezing pain. So Webster's defines pain as a localized or general unpleasant bodily sensation, um, which causes mild to severe physical discomfort and emotional distress. It doesn't say it has to be sharp and stabbing or even severe. So pain, which is less concerning for angina, is that which is sharp, stabbing, shooting, and knife-like. But pain, which is more concerning for angina, is more dull and diffuse. It's often described as an ache, a pressure, a tightness, or a squeezing sensation. This is very, very important. Okay, so classic angina, it's going to be a diffuse sort of deep-seated discomfort. Um, it's not a twinge, it's not sharp and stabbing, it's more of a pressure, heaviness, tightness, or squeezing sensation. Oftentimes patients will report a sense of impending doom or when they report that their bar is too high. And people may feel like an elephant is sitting on their chest. What about the location? Where does angina typically affect the chest? Well, it's more common in the center and left side of the chest. It may radiate to the arms, the neck, the back, or the jaw, but it doesn't have to. But if it does radiate, you should be more suspicious. Um, I saw a guy once I can remember early on, and he had tooth pain for months. He went to multiple dentists, they couldn't find a cause. He eventually ended up finding his way to my office. We ended up putting him on a treadmill and it reproduced the tooth pain, no chest pain. And ultimately, his stress test revealed evidence of heart disease, which ultimately required bypass surgery. So there are atypical locations. But central left-sided chest pain reading to the arms or neck is most classic. Under what setting does angina occur? Well, it's classically and predictably going to be provoked with anything that stresses the heart muscle, anything which increases myocardial oxygen demand, anything which increases heart rate or blood pressure. So classically, it's going to be exercise, which is why we put patients on a treadmill and see if we can elicit their symptoms. But any type of emotional stress can do it. And anything which elevates blood pressure or stresses the heart muscle out, like abnormal heart rhythms, like atrial fibrillation or SVT. Angina is typically alleviated with rest and relaxation. Um, nitroglycerin as a coronary vasodilator can alleviate pain, and certainly morphine um, can help in the emergency department as well. So what you wanna remember here, guys, is that it's not something that just spontaneously occurs at rest, it's going to be provoked in a predictable fashion with physical activity, like when walking upstairs and shoveling snow and carrying groceries. But it's not just chest pain. You may have other associated symptoms that may make it difficult to distinguish angina or heart disease from other causes of chest pain. So patients often have sweating, lightheadedness, nausea, trouble breathing, jaw pain, arm pain, even abdominal pain, and even back pain. And I've seen many cases over the years, particularly of middle-aged men who had abdominal pain as their only manifestation of heart disease, and they attributed it to heartburn or reflux disease that kept popping Tums or Pepto-Bismol for weeks at a time without any relief, not realizing that they were actually having a heart attack. And by the time they show up in the emergency department or my office, the damage has been done, and sometimes it's too late. So don't ignore pain that may seem like heartburn if it's unrelieved with the usual antacids. But while chest pain is the most common symptom, there's a certain group of patients who actually don't have any chest pain. So this study from JAMA in 2000 looked at over 400,000 patients presenting with chest pain. And they found that approximately one third of them actually didn't have any chest pain. 
And what subgroups of patients were more likely not to have chest pain? Um, older folks, women more than men, and there was a higher percentage of diabetics who had no chest pain during their heart attack compared to non-diabetics. Okay, so angina can be broadly categorized into stable angina, which is dealt with as an outpatient by seeing your primary care physician and maybe a cardiologist for further testing, or unstable angina, which is a medical emergency, which should be dealt with in the emergency department. So stable angina is predictable, and it's going to be provoked by a certain level of physical activity or stress that the patient will tell you about. Like I said, every time I go upstairs, shovel snow, every time I go on a treadmill, I gradually develop this pain or pressure. But when I relax, it gradually goes away, but then it comes back. So that's the type of history patients are often going to say. Um, stress makes it go away. Nitroglycerin makes it go away. Um, and it's usually due to a plaque which is built up over many years, narrowing the flow of blood in a coronary artery. Not enough to cause resting pain, but enough to cause pain under certain situations which increase the demand for blood when the supply for blood can't be met by this narrowed artery. Whereas unstable angina, this is angina that can occur at rest. Um, it occurs with increasing severity compared to normal, with less amounts of physical activity, and it lasts for a longer period of time, often requiring more nitroglycerin to make it go away. So this is kind of indistinguishable from a symptom standpoint from an acute myocardial infarction. So if patients experience any of this, if you have heart disease, but your angina is worse, longer lasting, or more intense than normal, you need to make your way to the emergency department because you likely have an unstable, inflamed, and ruptured plaque suddenly reducing the flow of blood down a major artery. All right, so when you look at angina, um, it's often going to be gradual and onset, almost like a pyramid, provoked with stress, and gradually relieved with relaxation in a crescendo, decrescendo passion, fashion. And with stable angina, it's predictable. The same level of physical activity creates the same intensity and type of chest pain over time. However, in contrast, unstable angina may have more frequent episodes of chest pain, or pain which is more intense than normal, or pain which is longer lasting than normal, okay? So if you experience any of this, you have to be evaluated by a medical professional right away. All right, so if you have chest pain, I'm gonna go over now what to expect in the emergency department. So certainly, if you have chest pain, you're gonna be prioritized, or you should be. Um, you're gonna get attention right away because the providers need to rule out an acute heart attack. You have vital signs obtained. Um, you have an EKG, and I'm gonna go over that in a moment. You're gonna have an IV and blood work and a chest x-ray right away, hopefully without much of a delay. Okay, so the most important initial test is an EKG. And the, the providers are looking for what's called an ST segment elevation on an EKG versus an EKG signal without that. And an ST segment elevation, I'm gonna go over that in a moment, um, is a particular indicator of an acute life-threatening heart attack. So what's an EKG? An EKG is a machine which uses electrodes applied to the chest wall in certain locations, which senses the electrical activity of each heartbeat. And each electrical impulse in a 10-second EKG is what happens, what's generated by the heart when the heart pumps blood, as you can see here. And an EKG can show evidence of a prior, acute, or ongoing myocardial infarction. That's why it's so important. So this is a typical EKG signal from a heart that's contracting with one heartbeat. You have a P wave, which is when the upper chambers contract. Then you have the QRS wave, and that's when the lower chambers, the ventricles, contract. And then lastly, the T wave. And over here, you have the ST segment. And this is what's so important to look at. So when you're having an acute MI or major blockage, this ST segment is elevated. And if it's elevated more than a millimeter, this is very specific and predictable for having an acute 100% or near 100% blockage in a major artery that's life-threatening. This is the type of thing that requires urgent medical attention and treatment. 
So if you have an ST segment elevation or malocardial infarction, you're going to be taken to the cath lab right away as soon as possible within 90 minutes. Ideally, is the ideal door to balloon time, sometimes even by helicopter if you're at a community hospital. And this is just a brief video I found on the internet of a cardiac catheterization. So you go to the cath lab at a major center like Bay State Hospital, not Wynn, and you have an x-ray laying on a table under a fluoroscopy machine. So an interventional cardiologist will access the artery, um, sometimes through the femoral artery in the leg, but actually more commonly these days through the wrist artery, the radial artery. And through a sheath, a guide wire is advanced retrograde up the aorta until they get to the heart and the origin of the coronary arteries. And over that wire, a catheter is advanced under fluoroscopy. And this is done under light sedation. Patients usually don't feel any of this. And then the tip of the catheter is then positioned in the openings of the three major arteries. And IV contrast dye is then injected down the arteries as your heart beats. Patients shouldn't feel any of this. But the purpose is to see if the IV dye fills the artery completely, or as you can see here, if there's a narrowing or blockage indicating a ruptured plaque of cholesterol that might be causing the chest pain. So when there is a significant plaque of cholesterol, the interventional cardiologist can pass a guide wire within the plaque and on top of the guide wire is a deflated a balloon and a contracted stent. The balloon is then inflated and a metal stent is then deployed, serving as a metal scaffold, restoring normal blood flow through the heart and alleviating symptoms. Based upon the location of the ST segment elevations, you can predict the site and the artery that's blocked up. So if you have an anterior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, this indicates that the blockage is in the left anterior descending artery, which is the widow maker, the most important artery because it supplies the largest territory of the heart muscle. And this is an example of an LAD territory plaque buildup. And you can see the narrowing up above. You don't see the plaque, but the plaque is there and it's compressing the lumen of the artery. And that's something that needs to be treated with angioplasty and a stent. Whereas if you have SE segment elevations in the inferior leads here, this corresponds to a blockage in the right coronary artery. And here's an example of a plaque in the right coronary artery. Seen right there compressing the artery. And if you see ST segment elevations in the lateral leads, well, this usually indicates that the problem is with the, the circumflex artery. So the quicker the artery is opened up, the better the survival with ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. And this was studied in the Horizons AMI trial and the Cadillac trials, which looked at over 4,500 patients with ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions who underwent um, stenting. And they found that those who had a door to balloon time, meaning the time you entered the doors of the ER to the time you had the angioplasty greater than 90 minutes, had a significantly higher mortality than individuals who had a door to balloon time less than 90 minutes. So the standard of care is to get someone to the cath lab within 90 minutes of hitting the ER doors. And that's because time is muscle. In this graph, you see that any duration of time longer than 90 minutes, here 105 minutes, 120 minutes, 135 minutes, 150 minutes, is associated with an incremental increase in the relative risk of death in a lower survival. And I'm happy to say I received the news from Patrick that the Bay State Interventional Cardiology team achieved a new personal record of door-to-balloon time of just 28 minutes, with a patient spending just four minutes in the emergency department. It's quite an accomplishment. Okay. So if you don't have the ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, it doesn't mean you don't have a heart attack. It just means you don't have to be rushed necessarily to the cath lab. So the next step is to check what's called a troponin. So if you have a blockage that's not 100%, but significant enough to restrict blood flow down a major artery, as you can see here, this is going to cause a reduction in critical blood flow to that territory of the heart muscle. And when this happens, the myocardium dies, or part of it actually dies. And 
this cell death releases a contractile protein called a troponin into the bloodstream that's detectable with standard blood tests. The troponin is highly specific for the heart muscle, found nowhere else, but it's not specific for an acute myocardial infarction. And the degree of troponin elevation correlates with the severity of the myocardial infarction with large heart attacks having a much greater troponin elevation than moderate or small heart attacks. And the troponin can be elevated in someone's system and detectable for even up to a week. But recently, we've developed high sensitivity troponins. And I think we're very close to implementing this at Bayside Hospital. I think it's been delayed because of the pandemic. But with high sensitivity troponins, as the name implies, it's a much more sensitive test for detecting very small levels of troponin in someone's blood, increasing the ability to detect a heart attack much quicker and potentially get patients life-saving treatment or discharge patients home if it's undetected. In fact, it's detected in 50% of the normal population. Um, and it has a negative predictive value of ruling out a heart attack, if normal, within normal limits of 99%. So on the right is the base state algorithm, but I just wanted to try to simplify that a little bit. So as you can see here, um, so if you look at the onset of a heart attack at time zero, and you look at the conventional troponin assay in blue, and the green line indicates the limit of detection for the traditional assays. And with a traditional troponin, it rises very slowly, and it's not going to be detectable for over three to four hours, which can delay care. However, with a high sensitivity troponin, the limit of detection is much, much lower. In fact, low levels of troponin can be detected immediately in healthy individuals, and it rises much quicker within an hour. Another way to look at it is that if you have the conventional troponin checked, it may take up to four hours to detect signs of an acute heart attack. So it leads to a much longer time spending in the emergency department. And to rule out a heart attack, it may take 12 hours, which may lead someone to be hospitalized from the ER to the medical floor overnight. For the high sensitivity troponin, however, patients potentially could be discharged immediately with the first troponin if the onset of symptoms occurred greater than three hours ago and the troponin level is very low, less than six. Patients can be discharged even after an hour if the total level is less than 11 and it doesn't increase more than three. And by three hours, if the troponin is less than 51 and it hasn't increased more than seven, patients can be discharged home. So it leads to much, rapid, much more rapid detection and potentially discharge um, from the hospital. This is even more important when beds are tight with a pandemic. Okay, so acute coronary syndrome is unstable angina or an acute myocardial infarction, a non-STEMI or a STEMI. And it's due to a rupture of a vulnerable or inflamed cholesterol plaque in a major artery. This then releases that contractile protein called the troponin. But it turns out there are other causes of troponin elevations unrelated to an acute myocardial infarction. And this is due to what's called demand ischemia or a type 2 myocardial infarction. And this is related to an imbalance between increased blood flow demand and decreased blood flow supply. So things which can cause this, uh, a pulmonary embolism, sepsis, acute kidney failure, heart failure, arrhythmias, and surgeries. And it's important to make this distinction because the treatment of this type of troponin elevation does not involve blood thinners and does not involve a stent. Instead, you want to treat the underlying cause. But any troponin elevation is a marker of poor prognosis long-term. So it has to be taken very, very seriously. So if you have a positive troponin and you think it's a few coronary syndrome, you want to take someone to the catheterization lab unless there's any contraindications or reasons not to. If you think it's due to an imbalance between supply and demand from some other cause, well, you want to try to identify and treat the other cause. But if the troponin is negative and you still don't have a good explanation for the chest pain or troponin elevation, that's when you want to think about doing a stress test. Okay, so what are we looking for with a stress test? So the stress test, you're not going to see evidence of a healthy artery. You're not going to see a plaque buildup that's 20 to 30 percent. That's not going to show up. So it's not going to detect any disease. It's going to detect significant disease most of the time. So we're talking a narrowing over 70% in a major artery is going to be detected. Okay. But who gets a stress test? 
Well, I would say anyone who has unexplained chest pain concerning for heart disease, where there's not another explanation, have a very low threshold for getting a stress test. But we also get stress tests when someone has heart failure or cardiomyopathies, um, exercise-induced fainting or arrhythmias. Sometimes we get it to evaluate uh, functional capacity with valvular heart disease, such as aortic stenosis. Sometimes we get it to assess someone's perioperative risk heading into major surgery. And sometimes we just get stress tests for screening purposes in someone who has multiple risk factors or a strong family history of heart disease. But who shouldn't be stressed? Well, certainly if you're suspecting an acute coronary syndrome, you should not put someone on a treadmill. These patients need to be um, cathed and potentially have angioplasty and stentin. If anyone has an unstable blood pressure or an unstable arrhythmia, um, a low or fast heart rate, they shouldn't be stressed. If you're thinking someone's chest pain, chest pain is due to a pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, or pericarditis, um, or if someone has severe symptomatic valvular heart disease, uh, they should not undergo a stress test. So when choosing the right stress test for the right type of patient, you have to first choose, how do I stress the heart muscle? Well, traditionally, and most commonly, we exercise patients. We put them on a treadmill. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, to see if we can reproduce the symptoms and um, elicit what's going on in the community uh, in, in a more physiologic way, real world way. But if someone can't exercise, uh, then we have a pharmacologic stress test, which involves administration of dobutamine or a vasodilator. And I'll go over that in a little bit. But you also want to ask, well, how do I assess for the heart disease? Our traditional basic stress test involves just looking at the EKG for changes, not ST segment elevation, but ST segment depression, where it goes the other way. Um, but sometimes when we have a high suspicion, we do imaging, either with echo or with nuclear imaging, in addition to the EKG portion. Okay, so a regular stress test, just on a treadmill, might be appropriate for someone who has a low pretest probability. We're not really thinking heart disease, but we don't have another explanation and we want to rule it out. If someone's never had heart disease or prior stenting, if someone's EKG is completely normal and they can exercise. Well, I think a regular stress test is appropriate for that patient. However, sometimes we have to do a chemical or pharmacologic stress test because it increases the accuracy of the test. And you want to think about that in someone whose pretest probability for heart disease is moderate or high. You certainly want to involve imaging if someone's already had known heart disease or prior stenting. Or if you have someone who has an abnormal baseline EKG, you can't interpret that EKG for any changes with a treadmill because it's already abnormal. And most commonly, if the patient can't exercise due to arthritis or other issues, um, they can't walk on a treadmill, then you have to use a chemical stress test. So basic exercise stress test, um, we put patients on a treadmill and we try to elicit the symptoms that they're experiencing in the community by stressing the heart muscle, increasing heart rate, increasing blood pressure. It's more physiologic. It also allows for assessment of long-term prognosis and overall death in 10 years. Um, you can evaluate for exercise induced blood pressure abnormalities and arrhythmias. But like I said, it requires the ability to exercise and you do have to reach a certain target heart rate. Um, and it requires a normal baseline EKG. So a regular exercise stress test involves the Bruce Protocol, which was first uh, developed in 1949 and published in 1963. We've been using this for a long time and it hasn't changed much. Um, it involves exercising on a treadmill in different stages where we increase the speed every three minutes and the incline. And we try to get someone's heart rate and blood pressure to a certain level, and we look for ST segment depressions. So there's a normal looking EKG, and there's an EKG with ST segment depressions, which is highly predictive for some degree of significant heart disease. And here's an example you can see from a patient showing diffuse SC7 impressions that developed during exercise but persisted in recovery. The patient only went for four minutes. That's not a good prognostic sign. Had limiting angina, the very same thing they were experiencing in the community, and had three millimeters of horizontal SC7 depression. Any millimeter is significant. Three millimeters is even more significant, as you can see here. All right, so when do you think about imaging? and not just relying on the EKG. Well, if you have a high suspicion for heart disease, if someone's already had known heart disease or prior stenting, if someone's 
baseline EKG is abnormal, or if they had an abnormal stress test before, you want to use imaging. Why do you use imaging? So a regular stress test, it's pretty good, but it's not great. It's a good screening tool. The sensitivity is about 68% for detecting the heart disease at present. The specificity, um, detecting the disease, if it is there, is only about 77%. However, if you add imaging, either nuclear or stress, the sensitivity for the detection of heart disease increases to about 80 to 90%. And the specificity increases also to about 80 to 90%. So it's a, it's a more accurate test. It's, it's a longer time commitment. It sometimes involves three to four hours in the morning, um, but it is a more accurate test. So sometimes if someone can't exercise, we have to do a pharmacologic stress test. Or if they can exercise, but their baseline EKG is uninterpretable or abnormal with a left bundle branch block or someone that's a pacemaker. If they have a borderline troponin, we're not sure what to do with it. Um, we think about a chemical stress test. And usually we do either a vasodilator study called a Lexascan nuclear stress test using an isotope called technetium, or a dobutamine echo stress test where we give a medicine that increases the heart rate while someone just rests on a stretcher. So most commonly, we do a Lexascan nuclear stress test. Now on the left of the screen, you can see an illustration of an artery. Um, and the red line, the red arrow, is blood flow. And on the top, you see blood flow through a normal, non-obstructed coronary artery. And below that, you see a diseased coronary artery with plaque buildup. But that plaque build, buildup is not sufficient to cut off blood supply at rest. And when you look at the nuclear images of a normal coronary artery, you see the isotope taken up uniformly throughout the heart muscle. And even with heart disease, it's also uniform because a diseased coronary artery has the ability to undergo post-stenotic dilatation. So the artery dilates distal to the blockage to allow for more blood supply. So under the effects of the Lexascan vasodilator, which is an adenosine receptor agonist, a normal healthy artery dilates, and this increases blood flow. However, a diseased healthy artery is already maximally vasodilated, it can't dilate anymore, blood flow can't be increased any further. So that's going to show up as a relative blood flow abnormality compared to rest, and you're going to see a defect in the nuclear imaging. So here's an example of a normal nuclear stress test, and it's just uniformly bright or orange throughout, and that indicates normal blood flow throughout the heart muscle. Contrast that with an abnormal nuclear stress test. In this case, um, the patient had a blockage in the right coronary artery, which leads to a blood flow defect in the bottom part of the heart. Almost looks like a Pac-Man, or someone took a bite out of it. That's because the, the right coronary artery has this blockage right here. So it can be very predictive. Now, sometimes we do a stress echocardiogram, either on a treadmill or using a medication called dobutamine. We look at different echo or ultrasound heart images, and we know that certain walls of the heart muscle correspond to the distribution of one of the three major arteries. So for example, here, these walls of the heart muscle correspond to the blood flow supplied by the LED, or the left anterior descending artery. This part of the heart muscle, the lateral aspect, corresponds to blood flow through the circumflex artery. And this part of the heart corresponds to blood flow through the right coronary artery, affecting the inferior wall. And Here's an example of an abnormal uh, exercise stress echocardiogram. To the left of the screen, you can see the heart muscle contracting normally, right here. So in response to the stress, the heart muscle thickens and contracts inward equally, and more so with the stress compared to rest. On the right of the screen, you see a wall motion abnormality. Same patient, and under stress normally, the heart muscle can contract more vigorously. But in this case, it actually contracts less, and it dilates further. And that's highly specific for a blockage. So we look for wall motion abnormalities seen with echo induced by the stress. And with this particular patient, they have not one, not two, but three blockages during the heart catheterization that required bypass surgery. Okay, so moving on. So if you have a positive stress test, should you rush right away for heart catheterization, assuming they're not having a heart attack? Well, you don't necessarily have to. I mean, another option to assess someone's overall risk and prognosis and identify the location of the blockage is to do what's called a cardiac CT scan, a special type of CAT scan, 
then at Bay State, not at, not at Wing or community hospitals, where they can do angiography non-invasively using a peripheral IV uh, inserted through the arm and injecting IV dye. It doesn't require the ability to exercise. It's a resting study. And it can allow for accurate identification of the presence, location, and severity of the blockage. So I, I sometimes consider a cardiac CT scan in folks who have an abnormal stress test, and, um, and I'm hoping to medically manage them, or an equivocal non-diagnostic stress test. And I'm not quite sure what to do with that. You actually look at the anatomy. Okay, so a major landmark trial came out several years ago called the Ischemia Trial. And this tried to answer the question about if you have someone with heart disease who has abnormal, moderate to high stress test findings, should they undergo revascularization with stents or bypass surgery, or do they do just as well with medicine? We weren't really sure until recently. So it randomized over 5,000 patients who were stable, who had heart disease proven on a cardiac CT scan, but also ischemia or poor blood flow seen on stress testing. And the defects were moderate to severe, so not low risk findings. They were randomized to an invasive strategy with medical therapy or guideline-directed medical therapy alone without stenting or bypass surgery. They were followed for over three years. And they looked at the composite outcome of death from cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest. And here's some data from that trial. And when you look at the primary outcome seen here, death from cardiovascular causes, death from any cause, and likelihood of having a heart attack, surprisingly, there was no difference between the group that got treated invasively with stenting or bypass surgery compared to the group that got just medication alone. Now, if they were stable, and then they excluded patients who had left main disease and a low heart function. So not everyone met criteria, but they were generally stable. And granted, this was only about three to five years, but it showed that early invasive therapy um, doesn't really provide any benefit in reducing heart attack risk or prolonging life. There was actually a higher risk early on of periprocedure myocardial infarction. But what it did show was those who underwent uh, revascularization with sensor bypass surgery compared to just medicine alone did have a reduction in the intensity and frequency of angina. So when, when medical therapy fails and you've given it a good trial, and you reach the optimal dose or the optimal tolerated dose, then there is a role for a heart catheterization in a stable patient to alleviate angina and improve quality of life. So who do we send for the heart catheterization if you're stable? Well, um, when the angina is getting worse and you've tried medical therapy and you just can't control it and it's affecting quality of life. If you, someone has life-threatening arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia, we want to take a look at the coronary arteries for sure. If someone has new onset decompensated heart failure with a weak pump function, it's very important to rule out heart disease as a cause. If someone's hemodynamically unstable, or for whatever reason, if you have a high suspicion for surgical disease, that being three-vessel heart disease or disease involving the left main artery, which is the, the trunk which gives rise to the left anterior descending and circumflex artery. And who do we manage just with medicine? Well, I always give it a shot you know, for several weeks to a month. If their angina is stable, if they're doing well, if they have no life-threatening arrhythmias, if they have normal cardiac function, um, and I'm suspecting maybe one, maybe two vessel disease. I don't think it's surgical disease. It's always appropriate, based upon the results of the ischemia trial and the COURAGE trial before that, to try medical therapy first. And what is medical therapy? Well, the foundation of medical therapy involves an aspirin. Aspirin is a, is a medicine that's been around for years, which inhibits platelet aggregation, or inhibits the blood clot forming at the rupture plaque. Statins, which reduce inflammation and cholesterol buildup. Beta blockers which are blood pressure lowering medicines that also reduce heart rate, and nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a medicine that can be taken under the tongue acutely to treat an episode of chest pain or preventively as a pill. Nitroglycerin dilates the coronary arteries and improves blood flow. And of course, you want to treat risk factors, hypertension and diabetes. Just a brief word on a couple of medicines. Um, statins are very controversial, but they're commonly used and highly recommended based upon multiple large randomized clinical trials showing significant reduction in cardiovascular death, heart attack, and stroke. They work by reducing synthesis of cholesterol in the liver. And this reduces the bad cholesterol of the LDL by at least 50%, depending upon the dose. They're thought to uh, reduce inflammation, stabilize cholesterol plaques, and actually promote plaque regression over time. 
So it can turn a vulnerable plaque with a thin outer shell to a stable plaque, thickening the outer shell, reducing the cholesterol buildup inside and lowering the risk of future myocardial infarction. Statins are very important. How does aspirin work? It inhibits platelet aggregation. Um, and this has been shown to reduce the risk of a heart attack or stroke. Now, if you feel like you're having an acute heart attack, you want to chew a full strength aspirin, not enterocoded, right away, and then go to the ER. But if you have stable heart disease and you're just taking aspirin for prevention, 81 milligrams for a baby aspirin is sufficient. So it reduces this blood clot forming here at the site of a ruptured plaque. Okay, so back to this. So if your stress test is negative, then what happens? Well, in the hospital or as an outpatient, you want to take steps to evaluate for non-cardiac causes of chest pain. So with gastrointestinal causes, perhaps you're going to get an abdominal CT scan, and that's going to rule out the presence of pancreatitis or gallstones. Or maybe your provider will want to look at your stomach, ruling out a stomach ulcer or an inflammation of the esophagus. And if they're suspecting a pulmonary cause, you might want to get a CAT scan of the chest, ruling out the presence of pneumonia. Or a nuclear VQ scan, evaluating for a blood clot in the lung and pulmonary embolism. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up on talking about some of the major risk factors for heart disease. Um, some are non-biofiable, um, something that you're either born with or you developed over time that you can't control, like age, family history, and gender. But it's the modifiable risk factors we really want to focus on because we can control these risk factors to some extent and reduce someone's risk of having a heart attack. Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and smoking are the major ones. So prevention is so important. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of obtaining regular physical activity. Exercise is key. And the current guidelines by the ACC recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate activity per week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week combined with strength training. So basically walk as much as you can and avoid prolonged sitting and being sedentary. Eating a healthy diet, and what's recommended is the Mediterranean diet based upon data. Basically it involves a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low in saturated fats, and sodium. And obviously stop smoking, as smoking is one of the major risk factors for heart disease. You wanna control risk factors that are modifiable at present, blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. And you want to take steps to alleviate stress. And I found a study called the Pure Study in the Lancet, which actually examined the link between exercise and overall survival. And it looked at over 130,000 patients in a prospective cohort study in 17 different countries. And they basically, through a questionnaire, they asked them about levels of physical activity. And with low levels of physical activity, patients had a lower survival over time. Those who had moderate levels of activity had a higher survival, and those who had the highest level of physical activity had an incrementally higher survival than that. So this study just goes to show that any amount of physical activity is good compared to nothing, and it may improve your overall long-term outcomes. So to kind of summarize, what are the strategies to assess your chest pain? So if it's worse with eating, relief with belching, maybe improve with an acid, I'm gonna think about a GI cause, but don't ignore heartburn if it's persistent and not being alleviated with antacid, because it could be a heart attack. If your pain is worsened with inspiration, coughing, associated with shortness of breath or wheezing, think your lungs. And if your pain is sharp, knife-like, focal, tender, positional, relieved with anti-inflammatory medicines, you want to think about a muscular cause. So what's the type of chest pain you don't really want to worry too much about, at least as far as a heart problem? If it's sharp, stabbing, a knife-like sensation, if it's focal, tender to palpation, if it's worse with inspiration, if it's worsened with change of position, only lasts for a few seconds. And if your pain is affected by meals and leaving it with that acid. But importantly, you don't need to have severe pain to have angina. You could have low level of a continuous ache. So the absence of severe pain shouldn't be reassuring at all. And when to worry more about your heart, if your pain feels like an ache, a heaviness, or a pressure, if it radiates to the neck, arms, or back, if it's severe, and unrelenting, and if it's certainly if it's provoked by activity or stress in a predictable fashion, and if your pain is alleviated with rest or with nitroglycerin, you definitely want to be thinking about heart disease. And certainly you want to have a much um, higher suspicion if you already have known risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, or family history. Okay, so lastly, 
just to summarize everything, to avoid this, do more of this. Exercise as much as you can. Try to eat a healthy diet. You want to do less of this. Avoid the unhealthy habits like smoking and being sedentary and eating junk food all the time. And that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you all for listening. It's been a pleasure, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Zicatella. This was an amazing presentation and just fascinating to learn more about how the human heart works and then what happens when it doesn't work so well and maybe what we need to be thinking about. So thank you again. Um, I do have a few questions that I think are worthy of um, your attention. So uh, the first question I had was from Carly. It, the question is on, about what is ischemic heart disease? Okay, so, so ischemia is when the heart muscle has an inadequate supply of blood going down an artery that has a significant cholesterol buildup. And we diagnose ischemic heart disease either through an abnormal stress test showing those um, perfusion nuclear abnormalities on a stress test or from an abnormality in the contraction of the heart using echo imaging. Or if someone has an acute heart attack or unstable angina, they're automatically given a diagnosis of ischemic heart disease. So you can have heart disease that's stable with angina, but you've never actually had a heart attack, never had an abnormal stress test, but not have ischemic heart disease. So I think ischemic heart disease is when you've had the abnormality seen on stress test imaging, when you've actually had an event where you've come to the ER with a heart attack or unstable angina. Thank you very much. Um, the next question I have for you, um, I think it pertains to possibly risk factors, but it says, what would cause an aortic dissection? So an aortic dissection is a very life-threatening but infrequent event, but we do see it from time to time. So I think the, the major abnormality that we can detect and potentially do something about and monitor for is an enlargement in the aorta. So any cause of dilatation of that aorta um, seen on CT scan imaging or epic imaging, um, should be followed very closely by a medical provider with, with yearly scans, sometimes every six to you know, 12 months. And based upon this degree of enlargement over time, and if it approaches five or 5.5 centimeters, elective surgery is indicated to replace the aorta with a synthetic graft and prevent a aortic dissection. But I, I think some of the other risk factors I mentioned, um, high blood pressure is a risk factor, um, certain congenital connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, um, inflammation of the aorta, aortitis, or uh, acute cocaine use are their known risk factors. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, I have another question here from Michael, which says, how often do blockages in heart arteries reoccur after a stent surgery when cholesterol and blood pressure are now controlled with medications? Well, I, I can't quote you percentages or likelihoods. I can't. I can definitely say that if patients are adherent to lifestyle modifications and taking evidence-based medication, an aspirin, a statin, any medication to control risk factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, the likelihood is significantly less, but not zero. So I have seen patients who have had heart disease, They've had that major blockage stented or surgically bypassed who go on to have further blockage. And some of that is, is just due to genetics. You know, it's, it's, it's due to um, hereditary factors that they have no control over. But um, as best you can, you just want to follow your doctor's advice. You want to take your medicines whenever possible and just try to have a healthy lifestyle, exercising regularly and avoiding those bad habits. Thank you. Um, another question here in regards to sleep and heart disease. Uh, Linda would like to know, is sleep apnea an indicator of a heart problem? Hmm. That's a good question. I do a lot of screening for sleep apnea with my patients. I ask them about symptoms of sleep apnea, loud snoring, uh, waking up at night, gasping for air, excessive daytime fatigue. And I do that because I know sleep apnea has been linked with um, an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation and strongly linked with difficult to control high blood pressure. But I am aware that observational studies, not randomized trials, have shown a higher incidence of um, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, and even sudden cardiac death in patients who have sleep apnea. But that's just an association. That's not causality. 
But I, I think if you have sleep apnea, you should do everything possible to get to get treated if possible, whether that's with a CPAP mask or something else, because it it's just been associated with bad things with the heart and with other organs. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Serena. After a heart attack at an earlier age, uh, apparently the age of 40, uh, they're looking at what is the risk of a subsequent heart attack? Does it lessen as years pass or increase with the improved diet, medications, et cetera? Uh, I believe this is relating to lifestyle approach in treatment of uh, a first MI. Yeah, yeah. So I think as we all get older, as we age, our risk of heart disease increases because the process of atherosclerosis begins in our 20s, and there's not much we can do about that. You know, I think autopsy specimens would probably indicate that all of us have heart disease at some age. Um, but if you've had a heart attack at a young age, um, and, if, and, if, and if you're able to modify those risk factors, you can do something about. Like I said, um, um, exercising, weight loss, eating healthy, avoiding smoking, taking the evidence-based medications, um, especially with the new technology we have and the, and the new developments in medical therapy, uh, which are even greater at controlling cholesterol and blood pressure, um, the likelihood of having another heart attack in this day and age is much lower than it's been in the past. Uh, I have just, I think, one more question, uh, or we have time just for one more question. Um, this person is asking a question regarding electricity issues, um, which is actually a great segue in a reminder that um, next week we have Dr. Shaloub talking about the heart's electrical system and the latest treatments. But um, this patient is wondering if they're having some regarding some, an appointment regarding some electricity issues with their heart. Should they hold off and pending or doing some activity until they see their physician? Um, hmm, that's a tough question. It kind of depends upon the electrical issue. Um, but generally, unless someone's electrical issue is unstable, like someone has frequent fast heartbeats or an abnormally low heartbeat causing symptoms or bursts of life-threatening arrhythmias, um, I, I don't restrict exercise. Um, I mean, unless exercise is predictably triggering this arrhythmia issue, but usually not. No, I mean, I think you've got heart disease, which is due to problems with the coronary arteries or the plumbing. You've got electrical disorders, which are due to the electrical system of the heart. And sometimes they're linked, but sometimes they're completely independent. You could have an electrical issue at a very young age and have completely normal coronary arteries and be very low risk for having a heart attack. So I wouldn't necessarily restrict exercise until you see uh, your physician, unless exercise is provoking the symptoms from the abnormal heart rhythm. And um, I have one last question that I just, I think I should ask, but um, it's a patient who has a family history of congestive heart failure. Is that something that they need to be evaluated for? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, generally, the younger that relative, the more likely it is to be an inherited condition that the patient could uh, acquire over time or have been born with. Um, so, I mean, if, if, if you've had a relative who maybe developed heart failure at a much older age, 70s, 80s, or 90s, not necessarily, but if you've had a first degree relative develop heart problems, whether it's heart failure, coronary disease, electroabnormalities at a younger age, especially in the absence of traditional risk factors, I think that patient should be screened. And the screening for um, heart failure would involve an echocardiogram. That would be the first thing I'd do. And probably an EKG, but certainly an echo. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Zigatella, again for your time and your commitment to treating patients with heart disease. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation with all of the animations, and I'm sure our patients did too. Um, I also want to thank all of you who joined us today for the presentation. It will be available online um, on the BayStateHealth.org website um, on, in the form of a YouTube video. And I encourage everyone to sign up and tell friends about next week's presentation on Heart's electrical system and the latest treatments, including wireless pacemakers. So thank you, everyone. Um, and we thank you for joining in one more time. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Patrick.